Let's think of what um, Paul's purpose for writing the letter, uh, well, in this particular passage at least. I would say that Paul's writings are not to prove a point or to win an argument. Um, and especially it, it seems that he's, um, he's lost for words, which so often I am, and he cannot articulate enough exactly how much God has done for God's people. And his last resort, in a way, is to say, look, this is, I'm just going to bear my heart to you, is exactly how I feel towards God about what I believe God wants for you. I can't put it into words, but this is my prayer. This is what I'm desperate for you to appreciate. He, he pours his heart. And so we've got this wonderful prayer in Ephesians 3, which I find myself referred to with a lot of my sermons at the moment. So it's a real blessing that I've got this to preach on. And um, <clears throat> uh, it's as, to me, it's kind of like the peak, as in P-I-Q-U-E, of the, uh, of the epistles. This is, you know, it's the, it's the mountaintop of what he's trying to... Uh, to get through to them. And um, he doesn't want his readers just to have, uh, to be right in their understanding. He wants more than that. He wants them to be strengthened uh, with might in their innermost being. Not just to have understanding up here, but he wants them to actually uh, be strengthened in their hearts. He wants Christ not to be a concept in their minds, but it, that Christ should dwell in their hearts through faith. He wants them to be rooted and grounded in love. And if you remember last time I spoke about the, the trees, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, um, Douglas firs, how the roots fuse together underground because they identify one another and they draw from that same arterial system. And he wants us to be, he wanted the church of the Ephesians and God wants us to be rooted in God's love together. Um, and then he says that, to, to, that they should, the height, the length, the depth and the height, that they should understand the height, the length and the depth and the height of, of the love of God. And I see somehow in that the cross, that Jesus came from heaven to earth to the very lowest depths of our depravity uh, in love. Uh, and uh, so we see the height, the depth, and we see the width of God's love uh, embracing all mankind. And he wants them to be filled with all of God's fullness, not just some of God's fullness, but to be absolutely filled with all of God's fullness. And already you're going, Whoosh. <laughs> not me, mate. But then he says, you may, uh, you may say that you're not able to have this. He says, but, un but unto God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can conceive with your minds. And so it should be for me as a preacher. My hope today is not that for the articulation or wise and persuasive words, but as Paul says, a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Um, if I, if I want to be an answer to Paul's prayer, my job today is not to inform you but that you may be transformed. That you don't just read about the vision of this love of Christ, but you go away partaking of it in the way that Paul means. Um, there, there is a hymn, which I'd forgotten in the previous service, but here it is, I've got it in this uh, sermon. It passes knowledge, that dear love of thine, my saviour Jesus, yet this soul of mine would of thy love in all its breadth and length and its height and depth, its everlasting strength, no more and more. And Paul is very good at paradoxes. And I think one of the reasons that we have these is so that our minds suddenly sort of, uh, we get, a, you know, like the fuse blows. <laughs> And we, we begin to engage with the reality of what it is we're trying to think about. Very often I say, oh God, you're great, and I have these great ideas. 
But then I let them go in my mind so my heart can be the, the bit that really embraces it because our heads get in the way so much. But I love just to embrace the reality of something without analysing it. And so Paul is full of superlatives and apparent contradictions. I mean, this first one, the height, the length, the depth and the breadth. I, I never thought much about this, but when I buy something at B&Q, maybe a box or something, you get the height, you get, uh, you get the length and then you get the depth. There's only three dimensions to it. But here Paul's got four dimensions. Where <laughs> I, think he, I think he was preempting Einstein. No, I don't think he was going into quantum science or anything. But there's, there's something there. If you say, hang on a minute, and then suddenly, you know, the, blow, the fuse blows. Wow, it's something bigger than I can understand. Um, I love, you know, these paradoxes that do that. Some of my favourites are the possibility of the impossible. Let's embrace the possibility today of the impossible. Not another church show, but something bigger can happen. The, you know, we've heard of others, naturally supernatural. Uh, now, the now and not yet of the kingdom people talk about. I'm not going to go into it. I'm just saying how these things just make us see that God's, God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than we can begin to think. Uh, I was in the doctor's the other day and he gave me these tablets. I said, well, I, actually, I'll be honest with you, I'm quite optimistic because whenever anyone gives me any tablets, I immediately think I've got better, quite literally. Uh, I had this pain in my side, I took the tablet, oh, I feel better already. <laughs> and I said, but, uh, you know, sometimes it comes back. He said, so, so I said, well, I'm pessimistic about my optimism. <laughs> Poor fellow was totally screwed up after that. <laughs> it was only half past eight in the morning. Um, and here in Ephesians 3, Paul is saying something fairly cryptic. He's saying that we should know the love of God, uh, which, is, which is unknowable. I think I can't remember the exact words. It, oh, it's gone now. But we should, that we should know the love of God that we cannot know. I can't remember the exact How can that be so? Um, how can we know something? Well, I've told you before, and it's, to me it's this. There's two types of knowledge. There's the knowledge of the head and the knowledge of the heart. The knowledge of the head is analytical. It, it deals with facts and what have you, which is brilliant, not knocking it. But the knowledge of the heart is relational, and it doesn't necessarily have to have the logic of, of binaries and opposites. No, it doesn't think that way in an analytical way. And um, I think what Paul is saying, that we shall... We, we shall know with our hearts and experience in our lives what our heads cannot begin to understand. And that's this, this breaking through into the heart experience of Jesus Christ. So with God's love. But I would like to say today there's a further hindrance than just it being something we cannot comprehend about the love of God. There's a further hindrance and it has to do with the inordinate habit in our human minds for us, uh, uh, there is an inordinate habit of the human mind. For us to go deeper into God's love, something needs to be removed. What makes this love so elusive? And sometimes when I'm praying, I just get a touch of it and I think, yes, that's what it is. This is, this is it. Uh, for a... Uh, what makes this love so elusive is not that it's so great and our minds can't take it in, but this fallen human tendency of not receiving unconditional love. It's so ingrained that we hardly notice it. That God should love me unconditionally is something my habitual way of thinking just cannot take in. And... There is this human tendency, it's an all-consuming, chronic, I'm talking about myself here, a chronic compulsion to get it right, where the desire for rectitude is more consuming than the desire to be loved. We have an overactive, critical faculty. We're so bent on getting our Christianity right 
that love takes second place. Being loved takes a back seat to getting it right, even when we like to think we're doing it for God. I'm not talking here earthly things. I mean, I've been doing the kitchen. It doesn't mean I don't care about getting my measurements right for my bits of wood. Or We're not talking about, we're talking about spiritual things here, about how we approach God and how we relate to God and Jesus Christ. What is God like? Let's just quickly look at the prodigal son. The father, imagine with me, he's the righteous man in the community. Everybody respects him. He really gets things right. He is a right man, righteous man. The son disappears, goes, takes his money as if to say, Dad, you, you, you haven't died yet. Can I have my money now? Uh, nearly as good to say, you know, <laughs> we should hurry up and go because I want my money. And Dad says, no, go on, take it, son. On you go. So he goes. Now, my imagination goes this way. People uh, from distant towns and places passing through, and they have seen the son, and it, they're reporting back and saying, that rich man, you know, his son is in a right mess, on drugs and whatever. You know, he's in a real state. And, of course, uh, they were saying, no, I don't believe it. And the news gets to the father, and the father... He, he's, he's waiting for his son now to come home. He's heard. Is he angry? How does he feel? What do you think he feels? Do you think, yeah, when he gets home, there'll be big trouble? That's what my dad used to say. Well, that's what my mum used to say, rather. <laughs> when your dad gets home, you're in big trouble. I remember smashing with my corky ball. Of, yeah, I, I, it st it's stuck now. Please pray for me. Um, <laughs> No, but he isn't. He's not angry. He's just waiting. He's in pain, is the father, the way I see it. He's in pain because of what his son's going through. He's imagining what his, if only he'd just come home. And as he comes over the hill, I can imagine the locals are all watching and thinking, here he comes. <laughs> oh, there's going to be guns blazing now. We're, you know, they're really waiting for it to happen. The locals watch expectantly. He's in for a good hiding, they're thinking. The son, as he comes over the hill, is ashamed. It's a bit like, you know, these people that go on these documentaries on telly, I don't know how they do it, undateables. It's hard enough dating people, let alone having cameras on you. But can you see him coming? Not that I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can see him coming over the hill, and all the people are watching, waiting. And he's like in the arena. Uh, the moral arena. Oh, he's got it wrong. But the father doesn't chastise him. He, he, he doesn't even want to hear his confession of how he got it wrong. The father feels his shame and his loneliness. Have you ever had someone who's really sorry... And you, and you think, yeah, they should be sorry. But you, you, go a little, you feel a bit loving and you think, oh, I really feel for them. They, they, they feel wrong enough now. I don't want them to feel that bad. And I think the father feels, he's feeling his shame, he's feeling his loneliness. And he doesn't play into the expectations of the onlookers to show how right he is. He runs out to meet his son and he embraces him to alleviate his shame to share his loneliness and feel the pain that he brings. He said, all the arena there watching, what's the righteous man going to do? He's going to do it right. And he says, no, I'm foregoing the right for the sake of love. And he, he feels the loneliness and the pain with his son in the open country there. And this is the God we adore our faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power and knows neither measure nor end. The son decides, he's thinking, look, make me like one of your employees. No, God's not like that. God isn't some cosmic employer. <laughs> you know, he's got a lot of, I'm, and I'm not knocking, this is where we get the balance of what we're thinking today about work. The work we do is not something like an employer that we've got to produce the goods and they have to, you know what I mean? And uh, it, it, there's remuneration for it. And if you've, no, 
God is not a cosmic employer. Whatever our work for God involves, it's not that sort of work because God is a, not a cosmic employer seeking results, but a loving father a seeking relationship that we should receive his love. Now, under the Old Testament, under the law, rightness was the condition and the end to which all spiritual activity aimed. Then God could love. With this attitude, though, the trouble is that if we earn God's love, whatever it is we think we've earned isn't the love that God wanted us to have. Love can only fit the shape of empty hands. No deserts, just the, the love of God. And this love is often contrasted with the law and its demands for pious religious activity and moral scrupulousness where all that matters is to get it right. Yeah, I bet a lot of us are here because we want to get it right. <laughs> we want to get our Christianity just right. Oh, I want to be a good Christian. Sorry, I'm a bit, a bit facetious. And this was what Jesus was confronting with the Pharisees, to get it right. Now, Paul talks about freedom from the law. In Rome, people are familiar with Romans 6 and Romans 8, but Romans 7 is a key passage. And I can't go into it now, of course, because we're not doing Romans 7. But it's a key passage for understanding Romans 6. And what he's saying is that we are dead to the law that we should be married to another. We're dead to the principles and the demands of the law that we should be married to another. Not just, we'll, we'll look at it in this minute. What he's saying is Jesus is not so much the answer to sin, but the remover of the premise of the question. The remover of the problem that requires a solution. So it's one thing to be freed from sin it's, you know, they talk about dead to sin in Romans. Um, and it's, oh, it means, be, it means becoming a sinless person. No, the power of sin is in the law. So Jesus has fulfilled the law through his death so that we're no longer under the law. And in fact, Paul's words couldn't be more direct. We are dead to the power of the law to condemn us. So we're no longer, it's a whole new ball game. Jesus didn't just change the rules of the game when he came, but he lifted us out of the game and it's a whole new ball game. It's a new arena where the old categories of right and wrong no longer apply because they've been fulfilled. A new principle with a totally different set of categories and a different language is introduced. Not am I right or am I wrong? But am I living in God's love or am I afraid? And when Jesus died on the cross, he more than satisfied the needs of the law. More than satisfied. Did you watch, are you watching Les Miserables or anybody on the telly? No, nah, yeah. And I loved it when he had to purchase the, the girl, the little girl. And they were trying to rip him off. They were saying, we want a thousand Pounds. No, 1,500. And you know, you're thinking, he's got, you're not getting that. But he said, how much do you want? Have it all. He just, you know, all right, you want one that have it. And uh, yeah, yeah, we want extra money now for your, for your room. We want 50 pounds or whatever it was. Have it. And it says, oh, Jesus paid it like that more than enough, as long as my people can be set free to love. And if God has not set us free. A freedom does, does not set us free to love like Jesus loved is no freedom at all. And that's what God's called us to be and to do. The church, we little realise how this moral insistence is embedded in our culture and our society, our worldview, and particularly in the church. We've just celebrated 500 years of the Reformation. And do you know that there are, at the moment, according to Pew Research, 47,000 denominations. <laughs> 47,000 people thinking they've got it right. <laughs> and the others have got it wrong. Someone wrote a blog about it. 
Uh, he was a Catholic, so he was getting really into it. Uh, and he said, actually, they've got it wrong. It's 35,500. I thought, oh, fair enough then. The word schism, if you look it up in a dictionary or online, has its heaviest usage in the history of Christianity. Loads of people who are inordinately passionate about getting it right instead of discovering the love of God. And we do it all the time. I do it all the time. Just put the news on. <laughs> Everybody's got it wrong, haven't they? Yeah? 30 minutes of legitimate critical indulgence. He should be wearing a seatbelt. She's a useless prime minister. He's made a stupid decision. This isn't right. That's not right. And, it, and uh, you know, it, this is what we're like. And if we're not assessing the rightness of a thing, an idea or a statement, it'll be the moral suitability of an action or a person. They haven't got it right. He should have indicated. Oh, he got that wrong. Oh, she got, oh that sermon, he's got that wrong. <laughs> he ain't got it right. No, no, he, 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 we won't have him next time. And then, of course, if we've got any time left at all, we're assessing ourselves. Have I got it right? Am I doing it right? Am I okay? And if we're honest, it's the continuous monologue in our heads is to do with getting it right. I discovered a term called the imposter syndrome. I think I actually suffer from it. Bear with me there. <laughs> <laughs> the imposter syndrome, if you look it up, it's the incessant thoughts of oneself that you're a fake. <laughs> And the constant fear that you'll be found out to be an imposter. It happens in, it's a major problem amongst professionals. And I think it's probably quite a problem in the church as well, when we come to church. Um, I have a, sometimes, and I, I know when you come with your families, you've not got time to think about how you feel. But there's a little anxiety for me coming to church. Whenever I come to church, I feel this little anxiety. And, and uh, you know, and, and it's something to do with this, in, this imposter syndrome. Oh, oh what? I've got, I can't be seen to be faking it. And then the anxiety, I think, oh, I shouldn't feel like that. Oh, that <laughs> makes it, that, that, that snowballs it. <laughs> I shouldn't feel like that. I, I'm a fake. I'm an imposter. So um, I must look happy. I've got to, uh, you know, I've got to uh, up the level of impressing people a bit more. Um, and some give up, they can't keep it up so they don't come. Because church is a place where they've got to put on a pose in order to cover up their sense of being an imposter or a fake. And um, I shared this, I've been seeing Peter in the hospice and I shared, I said, you know, Peter, sometimes, I hate to say it, but for me, church is the hardest place to find God. <laughs> I hate to say it, uh, and I, I sometimes, you know, feel a real anxiety about coming because I, I just feel suddenly I've got to up the ante for some reason. I, I, you know, I thought I could share it with Peter because I'm sharing it with you now. And um, he he's, he can hardly get any words out. In fact, he only had said three or four words, but he just, he was curled up in bed. He just said, hypocrites. Oh, I Hypocrites, uh, and I, I can quite happily say that because I've realised the best way to overcome hypocrisy is to own that you are one. So I join with you in that. But we, this is the problem: hypocrisy. And perhaps this love, this is what's preventing us from entering deeper into unconditional love. This perpetual need to impress. This perpetual need to get it right it's but when we that love does come it's what let what's left in our christian experience when we stop trying to get it right when i stop trying <laughs> to get my sermon right when you stop trying to assess whether i've got it right <laughs> when we let go of this need to be right we're letting go into love if just for one moment we taste with our hearts the total absence of critical evaluation 
of this moral monologue to the extent in Romans 7 that it actually isn't there because we're dead to it. We're married to love to another. Just for one minute, you'll say your love is better than life. I was created for this. This is it. Nothing else matters. I'm sure this will be our greatest relief when we get to heaven. When we see Jesus, all the pressure will drop. We didn't realise we were carrying it. Do you think heaven's going to be a place where people are comparing themselves with one another, trying to get it right? <laughs> is that your vision of heaven? I don't think it is. They're not occupied with their moral performance or trying to please Jesus. Think for one moment what it will be like. It will be great. When I asked Peter how he was in the, um, when I first came in, it was a strange thing he said, but he just said, playing the game. Basically, he's just wanting to go. He hasn't gone yet, but he's in playing the game, he said. And there'll come a time when we'll be able to say to Peter, and for us, the game will be over. You can rest now. But my old pastor used to say to me, it's not pie in the sky when you die, but there's a bit of cake on the plate while you wait. <laughs> it's hard for us to conceive of foregoing the right and wrong categories for the sake of love as prime categories. For anybody, yeah, you'll get me in a minute. But basically, I hope you can understand, I'm not saying just do what you like, it doesn't matter. But I'm just saying the categories need to sh take the shift. Love, right and wrong, instead of right and wrong, right and wrong. It's hard to do it, because we've been working so hard. Our sense of moral indignation will not allow it. In fact, Paul got blamed for being, you know, against the law. He got blamed for being what they call antinomian, but he didn't alter his message. He didn't compromise. He just said, dead to the law and free in the love of Christ. Perhaps those who struggle with this idea, can I say that the moral excellence, which is the fruit of the love of Christ, far exceeds that which the law can give. But I must add, if we're still making love a proximate goal for the sake of rightness, say, oh, well, you know, if I love God, I'll, I'll really get it right. You're still putting right on the top of the pile. Work and outcome is still our goal, and love is just a means to an end. But love is its own means. Someone said true holiness is largely unconscious of itself. Why is that? Because its gaze is wholly on Jesus. It's not concentrate. When Jesus went around, he wasn't developing his ministry. He went, oh, I'll try a bit better next time and get it right. He was filled with love and compassion. And holiness oozed from him. The gaze is wholly on Jesus. The focus and goal is love. Holiness is love's byproduct, not the other way around. And the closer we are to love, the more sensitive we are to its slightest infraction. The closer, the deeper you go into the heart of love, the more sensitive you will be to it. So there has to be a kind of, a, what I've called a deeper repentance, which is a kind of contradiction. Not only about whether you've got it right or wrong. Many times, oh, I've got that wrong, Lord, I've got this wrong. But it's that it depended on you. Your preoccupation with your own Christian growth has superseded the vision of God's unconditional love in Jesus. And in so doing, you are making the cross of no effect. But this repentance is a, a repentance not to be repented of. There are repentances which are <coughs> fairly superficial. Oh, I've got that wrong. I'll have to get it right next time. Oh, or it was in big trouble. You know, that kind of superficial. But there's a deeper repentance where we are letting go of all that we are and all we hope to achieve into the embrace of God's love. A letting go. And there are four things. God already loves you. What am I saying? Am I saying you can 
do something to make God's love work in your life? No, because God's love is already here. You can't earn God's love. You can't make it more. You can't get it because it's already here. Secondly, you've got to believe that it's possible that that love, you can know that love that passes knowledge and all them. You can do. Believe it because it's not up to you. It's up to God. And then identify the problem. You, yeah, overcritical, anxious. Next time you watch the news, try letting that go. It's overcritical. Next time the anxiety comes of having to perform, let it go. Just let it go. The fear of being seen as a fraud. The perpetual need to be right. The over-preoccupation with your own performance at the expense of trusting in God's love. And all the anxiety, which predisposes us to further sin anyway. Anxiety causes sin. So the more at peace you are, the more power you have to live God's life. Let it all go. In Jesus' name. And the results would be, will be, slowly but surely, new priorities will take precedence, and have, which have less to do with performance and more to do with relationship. Less to do with the binary of right and wrong and more to do with that of fear and love. The question you will be asking is not, am I getting it right, but is Jesus and his love my vision? How can I be my loving best in this situation? And then the next chapter, which we don't have a lot of time for, obviously. But chapter 4, the title is Unity and Maturity in the Body of Christ. This is maturity. It's, it's comprehending the light, height, depth, depth, depth and length of Christ's love. True Christian maturity, somebody said to me once, has nothing left to prove. Because you, you've got nothing to prove because you know who you are, as we sang in the song, and you know how much God loves you. But it will involve us being loving, gentle, bearing with others, seeking unity in the bond of peace. Not schismatic, but working together for the unity of the faith. Working as one body, to working together organically and growing together in love. And so I hope that this passage you can read between the lines of my sermon and that you can spend time letting go of the anxiety and the perpetual need even to get your praying right. <laughs> when you pray, oh, well, how do we pray? Oh, get that right. Let it go and go deeper into the simplicity of, of God's love. Um, Read between the lines of the sermon and, and make it your personal experience and let it grow and develop in you and be the whole motivation of your life. Um, the love of God in Jesus Christ. And uh, worry about the outcome. I, I think it's a bit like this, actually. Normally, we say I'm like a duck in water and people, like, what they mean is, that the duck looks really peaceful on the outside, but it's padding like mad underneath. But I call this a duck reversal. <laughs> You're resting on the inside, and you have the peace of God. And, uh, but the works you're doing are phenomenal. It's just coming out of you in such a wonderful way. And that's why Paul says, the, it, it wasn't, I have laboured more abundantly than you all, but it wasn't me, it was the grace of God. It was just me resting in God's love that has produced so much. It's not the works of the factory, the, the cosmic empire, but it's the lo relational love with our heavenly father that produces not works but fruit that will bring blessing, unity, harmony, and all the beautiful things as well as the <laughs> that we see amongst children. I think sometimes this is why the worship leaders and the poets uh, 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 and the hymn writers seem to have more going in terms of building people up than the sermons <laughs> because they're touching that place uh, and expressing a love that sometimes sermons can get so technical and theological.